I don't think there's been a horror film recently that really has garnered so much popularity through just word of mouth and being underground, right? Like, I almost feel like we're kind of in the era of when Halloween 1978 was released and it was being, you know, pushed around the country through word of mouth. Terrifier 2 is another one of those movies. Like, I'm still surprised they released it in theaters to all the normies, but I'm also so glad they did because now there's a much deserved spotlight on Art the Clown. Terrifier 2 was designed to be only a one-week theatrical release, yet at the time of this release of this episode, it's going on week three or four, and like it's still thriving. So this movie is truly an ode to the grindhouse era of horror movie filmmaking, and everyone's loving it. Like, not only are there practical effects that are some of the best in recent memory, but you now also have a slasher villain who is instantly memorable. And we're talking about Art the Clown, right? Like, Art the Clown is Terrifier, and he is terrifying. Like, they they got the name right, I'll tell you that much. So what we're going to be talking about in this episode is the first two Terrifier films. We're going to be talking about the first Terrifier, the second Terrifier, and we're also going to dive a little bit into Art the Clown himself as a character and really figure out how Art the Clown came to be. Like, a lot of people feel like Art the Clown just showed up overnight and saved the day from Halloween Ends. <laughs> Art the Clown has been around for quite some time. <laughs> it's, yeah, okay. <laughs> Art the Clown has been around for a very, very long time. And he had actually first appeared in one of Damien Leon's first short films titled The Ninth Circle. This was an anthology, and we see many monsters in this that were created by Leon, but Art the Clown truly stood out from the rest. And it was possibly because once Art injects his victim with a syringe at an empty train station, he simply disappeared entirely. Like, that's that's how they introduced him in the Ninth Circle, and they really created this, this shroud of mystery surrounding him. Like, what is he? Who is he? What's his motive? There's just so much that you don't know and that really adds to the fear of art the clown because the more that you have that's unknown the more your imagination starts to go wild and you get that fear of the unknown that's what you want you want the audience to create their own fear though the ninth circle was really just a (laughs) warm-up in 2011 leone released a short called terrifier and it was a 20-minute showcase of art the clown following an unlucky woman in a terrifying cat and mouse chase more detail was also added to his face compared to the ninth circle and it showed an evolution of the character since his first portrayal this was also where we first saw the psychopathic mannerisms of art the clown really begin to develop to what we know him as today Unfortunately, though, the Terrifier short was rejected by so many different film festivals, including horror film festivals, which I find super odd. But anyways, Leone decided to just post the short on YouTube. This is where it went viral. It ended up racking up over 120,000 views. So those are pretty good numbers, right, for an indie filmmaker. And that caught the attention of Jesse Baggett. He would become the producer of a horror anthology film called All Hallows Eve. Now, I don't know if anyone has ever seen All Hallows Eve, one of my favorite anthology horror movies of all time. I, I loved All Hallows Eve. This was actually my first introduction to Art the Clown. And I was immediately engaged. I, I love the character. I love what they did with him in All Hallows' Eve. And this was really the first time that you see Art the Clown in, in more of a spotlight role. Because what All Hallows' Eve did is it took the Ninth Circle and Terrifier, then mixed it in with a story of a woman being stalked in her own home. That was wrapped up in a story that shows a babysitter watching an unmarked VHS tape while she's babysitting. Which was a really cool concept because Art the Clown shows up in between segments to make it clear that he actually exists outside of the VHS tape. And that once this movie's finished, something terrible is obviously going to happen. And All Hallows Eve, it really felt like the pitch that showed exactly how psychotic Art the Clown is as a slasher villain. And Leone really had a special place in his heart for Art the Clown. He, he really believed in the character, he really cared about it. So he kept pushing to get an even bigger spotlight on the slasher icon. What he decided to do was make a feature film and then host an Indiegogo campaign to help get it funded. And that's when we got Art's first feature film with Terrifier, which builds upon the foundation of the short from 2011 while injecting some new things to help keep it interesting. And I'm sure you all know the scene I'm referring to. (laughs) We'll, We'll get to that, trust me. And every slasher villain has a motive, right? Like Michael's is to keep killing, Jason's is to seek revenge... Arts is to drug, kidnap, and torture people. (laughs) Like, that's been a constant through all the shorts and features, though how he executes this is what's really evolved. 
In All Hallows' Eve, Art retains a human-like appearance, but he starts to look more abnormal and demonic as the film progresses. His teeth are rotting, and his head and proportions, they get all skewed, which becomes really more intimidating, and it kind of loses that human component. And Art's also not really one for words, so you put all that together and you've got something really, really cool with the slasher villain. All of it also plays into his his mime-like clown appearance. Like, he only uses noises that kind of sound like deranged laughter, but he doesn't even really make noises. Like, you think you're hearing the noises in your head whenever you see him do the miming gestures. It's really weird. I don't know about you guys, but, like, the impact that Art the Clown has when... Uh, like as being a part of the audience, it's incredible. It's it's just an experience every time you're watching Terrifier. Like he's also stabbed in the eyes and in the back, yet he carries on pretty much undamaged from what happens. And this this is kind of an evolution of the character Art the Clown because it really lays the foundation for some level of superhuman strength or supernatural abilities which weren't really present in the short films. And this even goes further in the Terrifier movies. Like Art even starts to show cannibalistic nature by eating faces. But we'll go into that. We'll, we're going to talk about that. This evolution and the fact that Art is a clown it's really difficult to not compare the character to Pennywise, right? Like, I'm sure all of us, you know, at one point or another thought of Pennywise because of the fact that Art's a clown. Even though the two are completely different in nature. Like, there, there's truly no comparison, right? It's just they're both different clowns. And the comparisons between Pennywise and Art the Clown was actually something Leone was trying to avoid as well. He created Art the Clown to be the exact opposite of Pennywise. He wanted it to be devoid of color and not say a word, and also to reflect his admiration for the exploitation sensibilities of 70s grindhouse movies. And while at the same time, like, Art may have some hints here of supernatural elements to him, he's more human-like than, than a cosmic entity like Pennywise was, right? Art resembles that authentic serial killer look, who is just utterly brutal and truly unlike anything that we have really ever seen before. Where Pennywise? Pennywise is more known for his charm and allure when luring in his victims. So the first Terrifier film, it premiered at the Telluride Horror Show Film Festival in 2016. It was then screened later on the Horror Channel Fright Fest on October 28, 2017, which then got it picked up for a limited release in 2018. The movie, of course, immediately hit cult status, right? The sequel, of course, is now being even bigger than the original. And people absolutely love Art the Clown, and they love Terrifier, right? So if you haven't seen the movie, you haven't heard about it, we're about to dive right into it. And we're going to talk about exactly what happens and how this movie cemented Art the Clown as a slasher icon. So the first Terrifier film starts off with a man watching a small TV where we see a talk show host, Monica Brown. She's interviewing a woman who we learn is the sole survivor of a massacre that happened last Halloween. We end up seeing the woman's face, and she's completely disfigured. And we find out this was at the hands of Art the Clown, who has disappeared from the morgue at this point. The man watching the TV, he kicks it, shatters the glass, and begins filling a garbage bag with bladed objects. Wonder who that would be? Obviously, it's Art the Clown. We then see Monica, the talk show host. She's backstage talking to her boyfriend on her cell phone. She's bashing the disfigured woman that she was just interviewing. And of course, in the background, there's a disfigured woman who hears the entire conversation. So once Monica hangs up the phone... The disfigured woman starts attacking Monica and completely gouges her eyes out. And this scene was a truly excellent way to set the bar on what was to come. Like, we got incredible practical effects and a scene that makes us feel immediately disturbed. <laughs> like, you wouldn't expect a survivor of a massacre to quickly become a killer. Like, that was definitely out of nowhere, yet, of course, very justified. <laughs> but I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. We then learn that it's Halloween night. And we meet two friends, Tara and Dawn, who are wandering drunk to Dawn's car. Typical teenage kids on a Halloween night. This is when they notice a strange man in a clown costume who follows them into a nearby pizza joint. The scene that follows here, it really displays Art's creepy and overall terrifying nature. Like, he doesn't say a word when he gets into that pizzeria. He doesn't say a word. He just simply sits down, stares across the restaurant at these two girls, and creeps them out the entire time. He eventually ends up getting kicked out, but only because he, he, he smeared feces <laughs> all over the bathroom walls. <laughs> like, totally gross, obviously. But it just goes to show how deranged and how far are, they were willing to go with this character like this early into the movie. So the two girls inside the pizzeria, they wait around a bit for him to leave and get out of the area before they head back out themselves. 
When they get back to Don's car, they find, lo and behold, the tires have been slashed. Gee, I wonder who slashed those. So they call Tara's sister for help. Tara ends up finding a derelict apartment building where she asks Mike, a pest control worker, if she can use the restroom. He reluctantly allows her to, and then she ends up wandering inside the building and runs into a mentally deranged woman who's carrying a doll. Now, this woman addresses Tara as her new neighbor, and you automatically know that she's totally fucked up. <laughs> like, she does not look all in the head, and she's super creepy at the same time. Also, she's carrying a doll who she believes to be her infant child. So that should tell you right there exactly how mentally stable this lady is. Not very much. So Art ends up showing back up at the pizzeria from earlier, and he kills those workers who kicked him out by brutally mutilating them, and then he ends up kidnapping Tara's friend, Dawn. Back at the apartment building, Art shows up because he's trying to find the other half, Tara, and it was a pretty sinister cat and mouse scene that happens here, because once Tara realizes that Art's on the trail and Art kind of realizes Tara knows... It's straight up a cat and mouse chase in this little garage. And the way they shot it, the way Art just creeps and stalks around corners and even just an open plain sight, it's absolutely terrifying. <laughs> like, super creepy. And it just has this overall allure of you want to know more, right? Like, you want to know what his motive is, what caused him to start killing. Is he human? Is he supernatural? Is he a demon? Like, you don't know. And having that unknown really makes you more interested in the character. And it also prevents you from putting boundaries. Like, you, you're creating a character at that point that doesn't have specific boundaries they have to, or a box they have to be in, right? Like, if it's a demon, it has to act this way. If it's a deranged psychopath who broke from a mental institution, he should be acting this way. Like, it takes it out of the box and allows you to just grow the character however you want it to be. And that also means there's no limits. And they really show that when it comes to Terrifier and Art the Clown. So as this cat and mouse game is continuing between Tara and Art, Tara ends up seeing Mike, the pest control guy. So she, of course, tries to alert him of the incoming onslaught, but Art finds her first and ends up drugging her and kidnapping her. And when Tara wakes up, she finds herself bound to a chair. And in front of her is Art the Clown and a big white sheet. <laughs> now, this scene, guys, has been memed all to hell. Like, I'm sure you've seen it if you're in the horror community. Everyone knows the scene I'm about to talk about, because at the time, it was definitely the most gruesome and brutal scene ever to be shot on film. So Art pulls down this white sheet to reveal Tara, and it's Tara suspended upside down from the ceiling, completely naked. Art then takes out a hacksaw and starts from the top of Tara and saws her completely in half while Dawn is forced to sit there and watch it all happen. <laughs> like, this scene was so brutal and is by far my favorite scene of the entire movie. Now, the reason being is because the practical effects of this were beyond what I've ever seen before. Like, the creativity and the way the effects were executed is just a work of art. See what I did there? So Tara ends up freeing herself from the restraints that Art had on her in the chair, but at the same time, Art pulls out a handgun and starts shooting her brutally. And this moment for me was very, very interesting. Because I don't think I can recall a time that I've ever seen a slasher change their weapon so drastically mid-movie. Like, yeah, you know, there's been some who went from a knife to a different bladed object or a blunt object. But Art went for a gun, and I think that's what gets me the most, is that Art shot a gun to make his kill. And I found that to be quite unique. Because I don't recall a slasher who's utilized guns before. Like, correct me if I'm wrong, guys. Send me a message on Instagram or something. But I don't think I'm wrong. Because I don't think anything comes to mind that there's a slasher who's used a gun before. So that really interested me. That was one of the first times I've ever seen that. So, like, I was really like, wow, he pulled out a gun. Okay. <laughs> it, it shocked me. And this is where we also get to see that mentally deranged woman once again, the one who was living in the apartment building. She sees Art committing all these heinous acts now. And she goes and finds Mike, the pest control guy, begs him to listen to her, you know, tries to tell him that there's a maniac on the loose, he's murdering people in the basement. But of course, you know, she, she looks like a mentally deranged woman. So Mike just completely dismisses her claims. And eventually, he ends up getting knocked unconscious by Art with a hammer. Then the lady finds Art. So the mentally deranged woman finds Art cradling her doll in a scene which I found to be super weird. And I'm not even, I'm not quite sure if I even get 
this part of the movie. <laughs> to be completely honest, like, I'm not sure at all that I understand this. So the woman pleads with Art to return her child, the one that is just like a doll, that's just a doll. And she actually starts showing motherly support to Art in an attempt to try to get her child back, I guess. But what's really, really weird about this scene is that Art gets sucked right into it. Like, he starts sucking his thumb and gets cradled by the woman like he's a small child. Like, it was seriously just a super weird and uncomfortable scene. Like, maybe it was just a scene to show how deranged he is to kind of make you feel uncomfortable. But either way, I, I really don't feel like it really added anything to the movie or to the character itself. It was just a super weird moment. <laughs> So Tara's sister Vicky finally shows up, right? Because they had called her at like the beginning of the movie for help with the flat tire. She finally shows up to bring Tara and Dawn home. However, she ends up being lured into the basement by Art, where she discovers the heinous acts that have unfolded there. She looks down on the ground and finds who she believes is Tara, who's injured, but soon discovers that it's actually Art in disguise. This is another fucked up moment. <laughs> Like, there's so many fucked up moments in this, but this one was totally fucked up. So, what Art did is he ended up severely mutilating the deranged woman, the one who showed him that motherly affection. He actually cut out her entire chest and scalp, then put it on himself and began stalking Vicky, like he's Ed Gein or something. <laughs> like, it was a super creepy scene, and it definitely showed how deranged Art is and how far this movie's willing to go for shock value. Vicky ends up escaping Art and then finds her sister's corpse laying on the ground. So, of course, she's mourning the death of her sister, and Art shows up and attacks her with this makeshift cat of nine tails. Pretty cool scene, too. But a survivor actually reemerges in this scene because Art didn't kill Mike, the pest control guy. <laughs> the pest control guy comes to save the day. He ends up knocking Art completely unconscious, and the two of them flee together. Before they can escape, though, Art reappears and murders Mike while Vicky retreats into a garage. Art rams a pickup truck right through the door and completely disarms Vicky and injures her. So she lies helplessly there on the ground. Art starts eating her face. <laughs> like, I kid you not. He's literally there eating her face. Um, so the police finally show up. They find Art at the scene, uh, bloody bodies everywhere. But before they can take him down, he ends up putting a gun in his mouth and shoots himself in the back of the head. And then we also find out that despite Vicky getting her face eaten and everything, she's actually still alive. So we go over to the morgue and we see Art, right? He's with the medical examiner and then medical examiner tries to get a look at Art and he comes back to life and then strangles him. <laughs> so we know Art the Clown's not dead at this point. Fast forward one year later and we see that Vicky is actually still alive. She turns out to be the disfigured woman from the beginning of the movie, the one who was being interviewed and ended up killing the talk show host, which I found to be a really cool twist. <laughs> because, like, the best kind of twists are the ones you don't see coming, right? And I didn't even think that after having her face eaten by Art that she would still be alive, let alone, you know, someone who was going on a murder, let alone someone who would commit murder. And this also shows that the entire movie we watched actually took place the previous year. And it was pretty much a flashback. So I truly enjoyed that. You know, I really enjoyed Terrifier. And I feel like this movie was developed as a pitch for Art the Clown to be the next slasher icon. And a way to just make a movie that was truly disturbing and terrifying. <laughs> like, at its core, this movie is absolutely disturbing. And it doesn't really have much of a narrative. Like, outside of the kills and Art's charisma, there's nothing really to sink your teeth into. Like, they really changed that when it came to Terrifier 2, but the first one, and it was a big complaint that I saw from many in the horror community, it was the lack of narrative in the first Terrifier film. Like, I agree that there could have been, obviously, a bit more direction, although for what the movie was meant to be... I can understand the lack of narrative. Because everyone complained, though, <laughs> Leone actually spent three months writing a more character-oriented screenplay for Terrifier 2. We first heard word of that screenplay from Leone back in February of 2019 when he posted it on social media. And the funny thing is, is that once the short film for The Ninth Circle was completed, the first idea for the feature-length film on art was actually going to be focused on art battling a heroine in an angel costume, though this version of the film was scrapped. 
obviously, if you've seen Terrifier 2, you know it wasn't scrapped forever because the angel-attired heroine makes their debut in Terrifier 2 with the character of Sienna Shaw. And Leone actually has mentioned that Sienna Shaw, the final girl in Terrifier 2, oops, spoiler alert, sorry, <laughs> was his favorite character that he's ever written. And Leone developed the screenplay for Terrifier 2 that was really much bigger in scope than the first film. And he had zero considerations for what the budget was going to be when he started writing the initial screenplay, which I think is awesome. Both Thornton and Scafidi, who are the actors and actress that played Art and Vicky, they were confirmed to reprise the roles for Terrifier 2, being literally the only two cast members to return from the first film, probably because they're the only ones that are still alive. <laughs> Prior to the start of film for Terrifier 2, Leone had already secured all the funding he needed for the film. He got it from a bunch of private investors. However, he ended up also launching an Indiegogo campaign with a goal of $50,000, and it was to support financing a practical effects-driven scene and attach a well-known actor to the project. The Indiegogo campaign was by far a massively huge success for them. Like, it ended up pulling in over 125000 in the first week it was up, and then by the time the campaign was over, they actually had reached $250,000 on a goal of 50000 So that's a successful crowdfunding campaign right there. And they started filming Terrifier 2 in October 2019, and they were able to get the majority of the main storyline scenes filmed and completed before principal photography was stalled because, of course, all movies got fucked because of COVID-19. So Terrifier 2 wasn't immune to that. And it wasn't until July 10th, 2021, that filming quietly resumed and ended up wrapping up. Then the following year was when Terrifier 2 had its world premiere, which was this year, of course, at the uh, Fantastic Fest on August 29th. Also on the same day, it premiered at Fright Fest in London. It was then released theatrically <laughs> on October 6th of this year to an audience of normies who absolutely had no idea what they were getting into. Whoever's idea it was to release Terrifier 2 in theaters, sir or ma'am, I salute you. <laughs> I salute you for what you did. I know what you did there. I know what you capitalized on. I'm a marketer too. I love it. <laughs> I am so glad it worked for them. Just incredible. Like, I'm sure everyone's seen all the fanfare that's surrounding Terrifier 2 right now, <laughs> and like, how people were apparently throwing up in the theaters, they were fainting in the lobbies, and this is really what's making Terrifier 2 so popular, and like, bringing it back into theaters, right? Like, it started and got released in 886 theaters in the US, and then went on to gross $400,000 on the opening day alone. And then it went up to $805,000. And then the following weekend, they made a million dollars. Like the first two weeks that this movie was released in theaters, right? Just theaters. It ended up making $3.4 million. A grindhouse slasher movie <laughs> made $3.4 million. Then on the fourth weekend, it went out to 1,550 theaters. And it brought the total up to $7.9 million. Like, this movie blew up, just like Halloween and Friday the 13th did, right? Like, literally, by word of mouth. Everyone has been talking about Terrifier, so everyone had to see it. Like, it, it was almost as if people needed to see this because it was like a badge of honor if they ended up sitting through the entire movie. <laughs> like, that's really what it feels like, and that's that cult following that's now put Terrifier, into cult, Terrifier 2 into cult status. Hands down. Like, there's no debating it now. And truly, personally, like, I'm not surprised at this response. Like, I'm a huge slasher fan, right? Obviously. And I truly thought I'd seen it all when it came to kills and creativity and practical effects. But then I watched Terrifier 2, <laughs> and damn, did they take that to the next level. Like, they took this shit to a whole new level. And the kills themselves are just beyond unreal. Like, just a whole new level of disturbing that I never thought I would see on film. I loved it all, though. And this movie's definitely in my top movies of 2022. So let's talk about what happens in this now iconic film. So the movie starts off right after the events of the first film, which I love it when movies do that. I love it when sequels start right from the end of the first one. Keeps you in that same mood. I love it. So we see Art in the morgue, and he's stalking the coroner as he's crawling on the floor covered in blood. Art then heads over to a mirror and proceeds to write his name on it in the man's blood, and then brutally murders the guy with a meat hammer. <laughs> it was an incredible scene. Like, you actually see the dude's teeth flying out of his mouth as the hammer hits his head. 
<laughs> it's great. But then, then they turn the dial up to a thousand because Art pulls out the dude's eyeball and then puts it in his own socket. <laughs> Like, I was floored at the lengths that this movie was already going within, like, the first three and a half minutes of this movie. Like, literally, three and a half minutes in, and it's already clear what you're in for right out the gates. And it's not going to be a good time if you are not into horror and slasher movies and Grindhouse. Like, it's just not going to be a good time for you, and you've been warned. Art then goes on to show superhuman strength, which I think is a very important aspect of the character to focus on, because he literally crushes a man's skull with his bare hands and then takes out his brain. Like, that shows a level of superhuman strength that could be supernatural, right? So as we're trying to kind of dissect what Art the Clown really is, like, is he human? Is he a demon? Is he some sort of supernatural entity? It's these powers that he exudes and displays that is something we really need to hold on to to figure out what the fuck art the clown actually really is because no one knows and we're still less than five minutes into the movie by the way and we've seen a man's skull get crushed and his brain being taken out so i'm just gonna leave that there art ends up leaving the building to a flurry of sirens driving by while he has that demonic smile on his face and of course carrying the big garbage bag so he heads into a laundromat to clean up his clothes with all the blood on it funny enough i know and he ends up seeing a little clown girl who starts pissing blood everywhere while wearing a creepy smile on her face. And it literally looks like a little girl version of art. It's, it's super creepy. <laughs> and I will say one thing that I was super surprised about with Terrifier 2. The amount of children who were casted in roles for this movie, it absolutely astounds me. Like, none of them are even legally allowed to watch the movie yet because they're not old enough. Yet, here they are in the thick of it, literally filming and being surrounded by that. And I think having those kids casted in those roles, it really lends to some of the uncomfortable moments in the movie. Like, Art and the little girl share a moment together of what seems like understanding and intrigue of one another. Then they have a game of patty cake while Art's literally soaked in blood. Like, how fucked up is that? <laughs> that is that is absolutely insane. The other thing is, too, though, is that other people in the laundromat, they actually only see Art playing patty cake with himself. So it kind of lends to the theory that this girl may be in his head. And that he's just imagining her, which I also found to be super interesting. Because it, is, a, is this a slasher villain who may be having a psychotic episode within himself? Like, that's an interesting concept to explore, you know? And I, I really hope we get to learn more about that side of art. Although, we get a bit tame for the next little bit. As we fast forward one year later, and we meet a teenage girl named Sienna Shaw. She's putting the finishing touches on her Halloween costume, which is an angel warrior that was originally designed for her by her late father. He had recently passed away after a brain tumor. And Sienna Shaw is going to be our main character of the movie. She is the girl who most of the movie is going to be focused on. And something interesting that I noticed about the filmography quite early on is that Terrifier 2 keeps those same visual tones that we first saw in Terrifier. Like, usually when a sequel comes out of a movie and it has a little bit more of a budget, more popularity, more buzz surrounding it, they try to take it to the next level and make it more polished, more mainstream. You guys know what I mean? Terrifier 2, I don't feel, has that. It, it's definitely like... A more polished presentation like it's really hard for me to explain but visually the two films are very connected it's just terrifier 2 feels more polished in its presentation like for a low budget movie the filmography is absolutely incredible in terrifier 2 like it's almost as if they were actually able to accurately encapsulate the image and feeling that you get when you're out alone late at night like, that's the best way I can describe it. I actually went out at night after watching this film, and there's nobody around, right? Like, I live in the boonies. There's not many people out at night around here. And I was checking my shoulder constantly for Art the Clown. <laughs> like, it got me. It really did. I was just walking across the street to the grocery store, and... <laughs> Like, I'm looking around corners thinking Art the Clown is going to come out at me. Like, it really got me. Anyways, now back to the film. Sienna's brother, we get to meet him, Jonathan. He seems obsessed with Art the Clown. He has newspaper clippings from the murder that happened on Halloween night the year prior, which were the same events that unfolded in the first Terrifier film. He's also doing research on who Art the Clown is, and he wants to dress up as him for Halloween, much to the dismay of his sister, of course. And the fixation for her brother really started when he discovered sketches of Art and his victims 
in his late father's sketchbook, which I found to be very interesting, and I was hoping there'd be a little bit more on that. But anyways, so... Another thing is is that I love how the first five to eight minutes of this movie are sheer brutality and gore. So, like, you have your warning for what's in store if you do decide to continue watching. But then it goes quite tame for a while, like a good, you know, 20, 20 to 30 minutes, I think, before we actually see some more brutal kills. Which, for the people watching this who may not be so adept to horror movies, this was kind of a trap for them, I feel. <laughs> like, they had no idea what they were getting into because it gets fucking intense. And, like, you may think, oh, you know, that was just the beginning. It'll be fine now. No, it gets worse. <laughs> like, the beginning was nothing compared to the rest of what we're going to see in Terrifier 2. Like, it really wasn't. So later that night, Sienna experiences a nightmare. And in this nightmare, she's trapped inside of some kind of children's TV show. And the star of said show is none other than Art the Clown. A super creepy scene unfolds between Art and the children. Like he's feeding them, and it's super creepy. And it ends in a complete onslaught of everyone there. He takes out a billy gun and just shoots all the kids. Yeah, he does. <laughs> with the exception of Sienna, though. Sienna doesn't die in the dream. And this scene left me with some serious questions. And it was questions on whether or not Art is actually some sort of supernatural entity or a demon. Like, he's appearing in dreams now. And he's causing things to happen not only in the dream, but in real life at the same time. Because when Sienna wakes up from the dream, there's a fire on her dresser. And the costume that she's been creating gets attacked. However, the sword that she was gifted from her father remains completely undamaged. So you know there's something funky going on over there. But the fact that Art is able to infect people's dreams and then cause some sort of reaction outside of the dream at the same time tells me that he may actually be some kind of supernatural entity. So it's now Halloween, and we get to see the talk show episode from the first Terrifier film once again. Only this time, it's Art looking on. And he gets pretty upset when Vicky says on air that Art is dead. Which is when I feel Art's like, all right, well, now I got to come back and I got to make some more deaths. <laughs> so Jonathan at school ends up seeing Art and the little pale girl. The two of them are playing with a dead possum, which Jonathan ends up getting blamed for in the end. And I found this scene to be very telling and quite interesting as well, because it seems like Jonathan was able to see the pale little girl. Like, we're not 100% sure if his reaction was just from seeing Art and what Art was doing. Or if he also did see the pale little girl. Because if so, this would throw out the theory that there's some kind of psychotic break occurring within Art. Or or whatever, right? So if he saw her, then maybe the little pale girl is also a supernatural entity of some kind as well. We then pan over to Sienna and her friend Allie. They're heading over to the costume shop so they can scout out a new pair of wings for Sienna. Because, well, the fire took out half of her Halloween costume, so she needs to replace that. While they're in the shop... Art makes an appearance, and he begins stalking and terrifying Sienna and trying to scare the shit out of her. Shop vendor also ends up having an interaction with Art once Sienna leaves, which leads to his untimely demise. Art then makes his way over to Ali's home, and he begins a brutal onslaught, and my absolute favorite kill from this movie. <laughs> like, they went full force on this scene, and it was incredible. Okay, so Art slices her eye then sculpts her completely, breaks her arms by literally snapping and tearing them off with his bare hands, and you'd think that would be enough for Art the Clown. <laughs> oh, hell no. So Allie tries to crawl away because, yes, she is still alive despite all of this. Art ends up pouring bleach and salt all over her wounds. Yeah. <laughs> Allie's mother comes home, ends up discovering the body in her bedroom, while Art is literally still dismembering the body piece by piece. <laughs> it's so fucked up, guys, but the practical effects and the way that this whole kill scene was executed was so gory, and it was just so for lack of a better term, tasteful. <laughs> like, it wasn't tasteless. It wasn't just gory for the sake of gore. It was a scene where you can display how practical effects can be used, well, effectively. Like, the mother, of course, ends up dead too, but <laughs> this scene was a masterclass in practical effects. Jonathan, he ends up getting reamed out at home for the events that happened at school earlier that day. And he ends up showing his mom and Sienna the sketchbook that he's been hiding, the one of his father's. The same one that contains images of Art and his victims from the events of the first Terrifier film. And in this book, there's also newspaper clippings of other killings 
which appear to be connected to art. And one of them seems to be the death of the little pale girl, which also is revealed to have been his first victim. So that is a very interesting key piece of information right there. And how the little girl and art are connected appears that that was art's first victim. How and why? We don't know yet. Maybe we'll find out in future installments. I know I'd like to find out. So Barbara ends up ripping apart the sketchbook and hits Jonathan. She has a moment downstairs being a sad mom, runs away. Eventually she gets killed by Art, of course, because Art's, <laughs> Art's going to try and kill absolutely everybody here. There's no rhyme or reason for it. He then chases Jonathan and drugs and kidnaps him after uh, a cat and mouse chase between Jonathan and Art. Next, we see Sienna, and she's at a Halloween party with her friend, Brooke, who ends up spiking her drink with Molly to try and calm her down. However, she ends up having a total panic attack at the party because she ends up seeing that little pale girl. So after that episode of the complete panic attack, Brooke and her boyfriend, Jeff, they decide they're going to be nice and drive Sienna home. However, on the way home, Sienna gets a phone call from Jonathan, her, her little brother, that he's in trouble, he's at some carnival. This actually turns out to be the little pale girl impersonating Jonathan so they can lure Sienna, which tells me that this is definitely a supernatural entity of some kind because the little pale girl was able to interact with Sienna. Regardless of the fact it was over, you know, an electric device and, you know, there may be some kind of EMP that can transfer, I don't know, but definitely a supernatural entity. She was able to mimic Jonathan and still able to interact with Sienna. So I don't think it's something in Art's head now at this point, right? Like, it doesn't make sense that that would be a psychotic break within Art the Clown. There's definitely some kind of supernatural presence around the little pale girl. So they end up heading to the carnival, which is host to the Terrifier Haunted Attraction. Sienna heads out. She tries to find Jonathan, while Jeff gets killed by Art and Brooke gets chased throughout the haunted attraction. Art ends up finding her and in a really creative kill, <laughs> throws acid on her face and then begins bludgeoning her to death. Like, seriously, guys, the kills in this movie were so fucking creative. Like, I would go as far as to say that Terrifier 2 had the most creative kills ever in a horror movie. Period. End of sentence. Like, there's other great kills, you know, don't get me wrong, but when it comes to creativity and execution of practical effects, I will side with Terrifier 2. Terrifier 2 is king right now when it comes to that. Sienna ends up finding Brooke's corpse and then gets into a fight with Art, who ends up knocking her unconscious. She wakes up, and she sees Art using the cat of nine tails on Jonathan. And this sends her, of course, into a complete rage, right? So she begins attacking Art, overpowers him, steals his weapon, and Art ends up actually stabbing Sienna with her father's sword. And then he throws her into a water torture cell to live out the rest of her dead days. And this is where uh, the movie got slightly weird for me. Um, somehow the sword that her father gave her resurrects Sienna from this torture cell. Like, I know they briefly touched on some sort of mythos that was going on with that sword. Like, they kind of hinted that there was something going on there in the connection with the sketchbook and their father. But there really wasn't any explanation as to what that connection was exactly. Like, I feel like there should have been more narrative surrounding that subplot, especially considering that it's the reason she was resurrected. <laughs> like, we don't know exactly what the power of the sword is or what its legacy is or what its impact impact is. So having that as to be the tool that resurrects Sienna is almost like a cop-out. Like I don't want to say cop-out because that's for movies that I don't like, but it is. I feel like it is a cop-out because they didn't really explain what the significance of the sword was to begin with. So she gets resurrected. She ends up decapitating Art with that same sword and then rescues Jonathan. The little pale girl takes Art's head off and heads out to end off the movie. Now, if you don't know, like if you've seen Terrifier 2 and you weren't uh, sticking around for the post-credits, there is a mid credit scene. And the post credit scene features one of my favorite people in the entire freaking world. The Ayatollah of rock and rolla, Y2J, Chris motherfucking Jericho. <laughs> like, I lost it when I watched that post credit scene. I'm like, Chris Jericho? Chris Jericho! It was awesome. And in the post credit scene, we also see Vicky again who is now institutionalized after the events with the talk show host. She's throwing up blood everywhere and writing Vicky plus art on the wall in her own blood. Then, then, she gives birth to Art's living head, leaving a nurse horrified. So we know there's going to be more Art the Clown, right? Somehow, some way, I don't know if they're going to explain it or not, but we know that there, there's going to be more Art the Clown. <laughs> like, Art's not dead. We've got more story to tell. And I'm glad because this movie really had it all, right? Art the Clown is so brazen. 
like he takes it to a whole new level with Terrifier 2. He has zero fucks to give. <laughs> and he makes that so clear. Like, there's even a scene in this movie, okay, where after he murders Annie, he takes her head and uses it like a Halloween candy bowl to hand out to kids for trick-or-treating. Like, literally, the top of the head is cut off, there's candy thrown into the top of the head, and the kids are grabbing the candy from this fucking head, and I'm like, how much more fucked up can you get than that? <laughs> Like, that is insane. And it's also super creative. And everything in this movie, like, it was just executed so well. And what I really feel separates Art from the rest of the slashers is that he doesn't really fall in line with the stereotypical slasher idea. Like, he doesn't have a lair or a specific place where he shows up, right? Like, you know, J Jason's got Camp Crystal Lake, Michael's got Haddonfield, Freddy Krueger's got Dreams. He just, Art just shows up where he wants and when he wants. Though it does seem that he is exclusive to the Halloween season. I don't think we've had any instances of him appearing outside of Halloween, which is important to note because he could be a, a demon or a creature or something that only comes out on Halloween, right? So that's important to note here. He also doesn't have a specific weapon of choice and ends up just using whatever he has available, right? Like it could be a hacksaw that he has in his bag or a machete or a billy gun. Like there's no one single method of killing, right? He just does what he wants. What I did notice though is that his focus is always on fear and torture. Like he wants to scare his victims before brutally torturing them while they're still alive. Like, at the end of the day, I feel like that's what he wants. It's for his victims to be afraid. Otherwise, he'd just end it and mutilate or dismember them for his own enjoyment. But no, he wants to see the fear all over them while, while he's brutally murdering them. The other thing I wish about Terrifier 2 is that there was more narrative surrounding the mythology with the dad and the sketchbook and the sword and how that impacted Sienna and the story itself. Because I don't really feel like we got enough of that for it to have really mattered in the story. Like, it was great addition. I really enjoyed it. I was curious. I was interested. But I don't feel like we got enough of it. We need to know more. Which I know is kind of contradicting to what I say before. You know, we don't need lore in slasher movies. But I feel like art is an exception to the rule. Because there's so much unknown about him. But there's so many doors and opportunities open to answer those questions. So hopefully we get a Terrifier 3 that'll dive a little bit more into this mythos a little bit. And that wraps us up for our Terrifier episode on the Cabin of Horrors podcast. Thanks again for tuning in and listening. I super duper appreciate it. We have had a lot of new listeners coming into the podcast over the past month, so I appreciate each and every one of you who has been checking out the Cabin of Horrors podcast. I hope you enjoy these episodes and listening to them as much as I enjoy making them. I love horror movies. I love horror culture. And we're going to be back again next week with a really special episode. I'm not going to say what it is yet. It's going to be a surprise. But I think a lot of people are going to be really happy to talk about this. So I can't wait to talk to you guys next week. And if you want to chat and you want to get daily horror content, you know where to find me. I'm always on Instagram, instagram.com slash cabin of horrors podcast. Also on TikTok, if you want to find me there on cabin of horrors and Facebook cabin of horrors as well. So feel free to send me a message. Let me know what your favorite horror movie is. And if you have any feedback or requests for the podcast, always happy to hear it and always happy to chat with more people in the horror community. I'll see you in the shadows.